28th of September in the year 2000, David Cam's day started like any other day, but it quickly spiralled into a nightmarish tragedy. He arrived home, and as he stepped into his garage, a chilling sight awaited him. His wife was lying in a pool of blood, and the lifeless bodies of his two children were still in the car, a scene that would haunt him forever. But as if the devastation wasn't enough, the unimaginable followed. David found himself thrust into the heart of a twisted investigation. Instead of solace, he was met with suspicion. The very people he sought help from, the police detectives and prosecutor, turned their accusatory eyes upon him. The once close-knit community was left in shock, struggling to comprehend the horrifying turn of events. How could they believe he was capable of such a terrible act? What evidence could have been so compelling that it led to his arrest, murder charges, and not one, but two jury convictions. Were the authorities blinded by getting a conviction that they overlooked vital clues, or was there something more sinister at play? Hello, my fellow true crime enthusiasts. Welcome back to Grim Riddles, and welcome to our new subscribers. We're thrilled to have you on board. Thank you for choosing to be a part of our journey. Our case today is the mind-boggling, confusing, crazy and tragic wrongful conviction of David Kem. Join us as we try to unravel the truth and reveal the astonishing twists in this tragic case. As always, viewer discretion is advised. There are crime scene photos and there are some details in the case that some may find disturbing. With that said, we invite you to sit down and get comfortable, because have we got a story to tell you. Kim and David Kem were married in 1989. Kim raised their children while working full-time as an accountant, and Cam was a state trooper who was liked and respected by his colleagues, including fellow trooper Shelley Romero. He was very trusting, very loyal, extremely honest. He could be trusted with anything, just one of the most upstanding people you would ever fathom in your life, says Romero. In early 2000, David Cam resigned from the Indiana State Police after spending 10 years as a road trooper. He had been on the emergency rescue team and had been awarded the department's Medal of Valor for his efforts in risking his life in an effort to try and save the life of a drowning man. Dave wanted to spend more time with his family and earn a higher salary than he was getting in the police. He decided to make a positive career change and went to work for his uncle. Uncle Sam had a successful basement waterproofing company, which he started from scratch and now employed about 40 workers. Dave quickly became a successful salesman and supervisor earning in six months what he had earned in a year as a state trooper. On September the 28th, 2000, David had been married to Kimberly for over 11 years and had two beautiful children, Bradley age seven and Jill age five. At the time, Kim had a well-paying and highly regarded position as a financial analyst at a major insurance carrier in nearby Louisville, Kentucky. And the two children were happy and well-adjusted and attended a Christian school in New Albany, Indiana. But three years into the marriage, Cam began having an affair with a woman he had met at the gym while Kim was pregnant with their second child. It was sheer stupidity on my part, says Cam. I allowed myself to get caught in something that never should have happened. And you know, I take full responsibility for that. Cam moved out, but a few months later they reconciled and things seemed to be back to normal. And at least financially, life was getting better for the Cams because David was making more money and had a lot more time for his family. I had never been happier, he says. I should have left the police five years ago. On September the 28th, 2000, after a busy day at work, Dave played basketball at the Georgetown Community Church with 10 other players. The one game he didn't play, he sat on the baseline talking with a church elder. Dave was at the gym from 6.59 p.m. when the alarm was disengaged until the security alarm was set at 9.22 p.m. when he and the seven other remaining players left. Dave's presence in the gym was accounted for by the other players and the church elder with whom he was talking. He never left the gym during that time period. After the game, Cam says he pulled into the driveway around 9.22 p.m. and saw his wife lying in a pool of blood. His two children were still in the car, with Jill still buckled in. Brad felt warm and Dave couldn't find any blood on his head, unlike his wife and daughter. Dave thought he might still be alive, so he took Brad and tried CPR but it was no use. Minutes later, Cam made a frantic call to the state police. Dave? Get everybody out here to my house now! Okay, 
Okay. All right. Well, why could my kids with kids? Everything's going to be okay, all right? We're going to get you. Everybody else not okay. Get everybody out here now. They're coming. Go to Dave Cam's house now. Okay. Do you know what happened, David? No. He then went across the road to where his grandparents lived and called on his uncle to help. One of the first officers on the scene was Detective Sean Clemens, one of Cam's closest friends. I always considered Dave a friend. I thought I knew Dave. I thought he was a good person. But Detective Sam Sarkison became suspicious after Cam told him he tried to revive his son Brad before realizing that his entire family was already dead. The crime scene looked off. It looked like it had been clean, said Sarkison. Police believe that Cam got home, killed his family, cleaned up the crime scene, and called them, all within seven minutes. Just three days later, on Sunday, October the 1st, Cam was arrested by Indiana State Police and charged with three counts of murder based on the bloodstained patterns on his T-shirt. The time of death was thought to be soon after 9.15 p.m. The probable cause listed 10 points of evidence, including a statement by a witness that between 9.15 p.m. and 9.30 p.m. she heard three distinct sounds that could be interpreted as gunshots. We've got some problems with things where they are. And that's why, you know, we're watching here. We'll give you, give you the opportunity for more. But we can't. Cannot really, it cannot be elite. What do you mean? They're people at blood. You are going to try to blame me for killing my children and my dog. I tried to clean some of the blood. I've never looked at that. No, no, no. This is ridiculous. What about some bleach today? No. No, 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 no. I'm not your man, Nick. We're going to be thorough on this, David. Something else comes up, points to somebody else. I guarantee you, hold on up there. But the fact is, the evidence that we collected right now, up to this point, up to you. Eight small stains of blood that a crime scene photographer interpreted as high velocity impacts better. The photographer Robert Stites was sent to the crime scene by Rodney Englert, who was hired by Floyd County prosecutors as a blood stain and crime scene expert. Since Englert was not available to visit the crime scene, he sent his photographer Stites instead. We will get back to these two men later. His family was outraged. I can probably see a husband or wife killing their partner in the heat of passion type of thing, but not your kids. You cannot kill your own kids. David could not kill his kids, says Cam's uncle, Sam Lockhart. Those who attended the game that night say that Cam couldn't be guilty of murder because he was with them playing basketball until he had headed home around 9.15 p.m. If those men are right, then it's awfully hard to believe that David Cam is guilty of murder. Kim, Brad and Jill got home about 7.30 that night. Cam says he was at the gym playing basketball until 9.15 p.m. and he has 11 eyewitnesses to back him up. Apparently, the autopsy had found evidence that Jill, his daughter, had been molested by her father, which may have set off a violent confrontation the night of the murder. I think that's a likely scenario, said the prosecutor. The medical examiner says Jill was likely molested within hours of her death. But by all accounts, Cam had not seen Jill since 7 a.m. that morning, nearly 13 hours before the murders. David Cam says unequivocally that he did not molest his daughter. Dave's sister, Julie Cam says, now we're saying he left the ball game, went home, sexually abused his daughter, then murdered his family and somehow got them, the kids, conveniently buckled back in his car. That's crazy. When their son-in-law David Cam was arrested, Janice and Frank Wren couldn't believe it. I just couldn't believe that the person I knew, thought I knew, could do that, says Kim's mother Janice Wren. But in the 15 months between the killing and the start of Cam's trial, the Wrens have become convinced that their son-in-law is a murderer. The murders of Kim Brad and Jill Cam gripped the small Indiana town, and as the trial began, defense attorney Michael McDaniel knew that all eyes were on the courthouse and on his client. Right now, David is the only one out there that they can punish, says McDaniel. My life is on the line, says Cam. I'm not just fighting for me, it's not just me. I want justice for my wife and my children. The trial took place in 2002, with the prosecution relying heavily on blood splatter evidence found on Cam's shirt. They claimed it proved he was the shooter, while the defense argued that the blood stains could have come from contact with his daughter's hair. 
The prosecution also brought up some previous allegations of Dave's infidelity and had women testifying to that. And perhaps the most damning were molestation accusations, all without any solid evidence. Unfortunately, the jury seemed to be swayed by the portrayal of Cam as a selfish and immoral individual, and he was found guilty. Because the judge allowed testimony about Dave's infidelities and the molestation allegation, the actual conviction in this first trial seemed almost inevitable. The jury members later admitted that the molestation accusations and infidelities played a crucial role in their decision to convict him. After the trial, Cam's family and others who were with him that night continued to believe in his innocence. He was imprisoned in protective custody due to safety concerns. The prosecutor's key evidence came from Robert Stites, who was supposed to be an expert in blood pattern analysis. The arrest warrant was largely based on Stites' opinion that the blood on Cam's shirt indicated high-velocity blowback from a gunshot wound. Upon appeal, the court recognized errors in the trial, particularly the improper admission of evidence regarding Cam's affairs, which had unfairly painted him in a negative light and heavily influenced the jury's decision. In the end, it became clear that the evidence against Cam was far from overwhelming, and the jury's decision was heavily influenced by the credibility of witnesses and emotional aspects rather than solid proof of guilt. In the second trial, the new prosecutor, Keith Henderson, conducted a new Fresh Eyes investigation, but many questioned its impartiality since the same agency was involved in the first investigation. The investigation didn't conduct new tests and relied on old blood spatter opinions from two witnesses. In early 2005, the defense wanted to re-examine the DNA found on a sweatshirt at the crime scene. They asked the prosecution to run it through CODIS, the criminal offender DNA database again, but the prosecution refused. The defense had to get a court order to make them do it. Surprisingly, it turned out that the DNA sample had never been analyzed before the first trial even though the prosecutor said it had been checked and didn't match anyone. Police and prosecutors ignored a sweatshirt found at the scene that had been purchased from the Indiana Department of Corrections that had the name Backbone written in black ink on the inside collar. Forensic scientists from Cellmark, a private lab, swabbed the collar of the sweatshirt and obtained a full male DNA profile. By 2005, David Cam had been behind bars for more than four years. Generally from September through February were my darkest times of the year. You know, the times of the murders and then you have the holidays and then the kids' birthdays in February. Did you feel yourself becoming institutionalized? I had to, to a degree. And for me, it was a matter of, you know, sitting back and observing and seeing how things operate so that I could fit in enough, you know, to be okay. You know, I had to lock the real me down inside. But now there finally seemed to be a break in the case. The unknown male DNA on the sweatshirt had been identified as Charles Bonet's. And just two days later, the cops brought Bonet in and started grilling him on how it ended up on the garage floor. That sweatshirt is in the middle of a crime scene of a triple homicide. Somehow that sweatshirt got there, your sweatshirt. You explain to me how it got there. I have no idea. Bonet admitted the sweatshirt had once been his, but said he dumped it in a Salvation Army drop box about a month before the murders. It shows up at a crime scene not laundered, not washed. If it went through the Salvation Army drop box, that would have been a clean sweatshirt. Your DNA, chances are, probably wouldn't have been on there. But it is. I see where you're coming from. As for David Cam. You know David Cam? No. You ever met David Cam? No. Do you remember the murder of David Cam's family? On television, yes. Do you know where David Cam lives? Only on television. I don't even know what his address is. The interrogation went on for some 12 hours with Bonet sticking to his story. The detectives released him with a warning. Make no mistake about it. If anything else links you to it, you're done. Stick a fork in you. And see, that would normally worry me. I wasn't there. Then two weeks after letting Bonet walk, there was something else something big. Early uh, yesterday morning, 
Uh, I was notified of some uh, additional scientific evidence uh, that linked uh, Mr. Bonet to the, uh, to the homicides. The prosecutor revealed that a palm print found on the exterior passenger side of the Bronco door frame was left there by none other than Charles Bonet. Investigators had been aware of the palm print for more than four years. Only now did they know whose it was. Bonet was hauled back into the interrogation room, and the questioning became more confrontational. You've got some explaining to do here, Charles. Your palm print is on that Bronco. You're there. Now this is the time, this is the place. This is your last stage that you're going to have to tell us what the hell happened there. This is it. This can't be happening. Charles! After hours of denial, Bonet changed his story. Yes, he did know David Can. They met playing pickup basketball. Then in another round of questioning, the story changed and changed again. Finally, Bonet put himself at the crime scene. The reason why I was there was to bring up the gun that night. That night. Bonet said David Cam asked him to get an untraceable gun. He said that he was a guy caught in the wrong place at the wrong time. As the events started to unfold in the investigation, uh, it became apparent that this case uh, was intertwined between two people. Now the prosecutor had a new theory. David Cam did not act alone. He had a co-conspirator. The ex-cop and the ex-con were each charged with the three killings. David was outraged. He believed he should have been set free. After all, Charles Bonet's signature was all over the scene. He attacks women, defenseless, innocent women. He takes their shoes, their socks. He holds guns to their heads and threatens to shoot them in the head. You know, all of those things from his previous crimes is exactly what happened to Kim. Why can't they see this stuff? You know, they just turn a blind eye to the facts. But the prosecutor had a different set of facts. We know that uh, the defense has maintained that this is now the killer, that I should dismiss the charges against uh, David Cam. The evidence is not there. In January 2006, Charles Bonet and David Cam stood trial separately in two different courthouses. While he wasn't accused of being the shooter, Bonet was found guilty on three counts of murder in the deaths of Kim, Brad, and Jill Cam. He was sentenced to 225 years. And the prosecution team rejected any notion that Bonet acted alone. Why? Those tiny specks of blood, they were on David's shirt, but not on Bonet's sweatshirt. His shirt does not have high velocity blood spatter on it. His story is the only thing you've got that link him to David Cam. There's no phone records. There's no one's ever seen them together. There's no text messages. There's no smoke signals. There's nothing between David Cam and Charles Bonet. At David Cam's second trial, Bonet was named as the other man at the scene, also charged with the triple murders. Otherwise, the case against Cam was pretty much the same, absent the female witnesses the appeals court had thrown out. This time, the state focused on the allegation that David molested his five-year-old daughter as a motive for the murders. Well, the motive was uh, Kimberly was leaving David Cam uh, and that she was leaving him uh, because of, of the child molesting and uh, he could not let her leave. He could not let that secret out. That was the secret in the Cam household. The defense countered, brought in experts to show there was no solid evidence the little girl had even been molested. The state's theory of why David murdered his family was purely made up. It was just, it was speculation. David Cam had never been charged with sexual molestation, but that didn't stop the prosecutor from closing his case with a big dramatic flourish. He took his finger and stuck it in Dave's face and said, you molested your child. The jury took four days to reach its verdict. Guilty on all three counts, we can tell you that David Cam has now been convicted of the murder of his wife and the murder of his two kids, Brad and Jill. Guilty again. Guilty again. With the same inflammatory evidence, this is just such a heinous accusation. In the third trial, the new motive used by the prosecution to prove David Cam was guilty were the life insurance policies purchased by Kim Cam. In this trial, several revelations came to light that helped Dave's case. The case was heard in Illinois as the defense thought that he could get a fair trial there. These are just a few of the inconsistencies in the first two trials. The probable cause affidavit used to charge him was inaccurate and misleading, relying on false deductions and speculations from an unreliable bloodstain expert and crime scene deconstructionist. 
the police and prosecutors also leaned on questionable witnesses and ignored crucial evidence, which added to the sense of injustice surrounding the case. Based on the autopsies and other evidence, they initially thought the murders happened around 9.30pm, which meant his alibi didn't hold up. The time of death was actually around 8pm, way earlier than they first thought. That's the time when David Cam said he was playing basketball at the church, so it seemed like Cam's alibi was valid after all. A phone call that supposedly proved Cam was lying about his alibi turned out to be wrong. The phone company realized there was a mix-up with the time zones, and the call was made an hour earlier at 6.19pm, which means Cam's alibi was back on track. They talked about a clean-up at the crime scene, but it turned out there was no clean-up at all. The clean-up was just the usual separation of blood when it's exposed to air for a while, so it wasn't as suspicious as they thought. There was also the blood spatter on David's shirt which raised some questions. They said it was high velocity impact spatter, but that turned out to be a mistake. Some other things that the blood expert claimed were also wrong, and this made people doubt his abilities. And what about that foreign DNA they found on a sweatshirt at the crime scene? The prosecution swore that they had checked it against the database and that no matches were found. In reality, no matches were found because they had never tested it. So it seems like there were some serious doubts about the evidence they presented in David Cam's case. Things weren't as clear-cut as they first thought, and his alibi seemed to hold up after all. Throughout the trial, the prosecution changed their theories about when the crime occurred multiple times, causing confusion among witnesses and public opinion. They also made serious allegations against Dave, accusing him of molesting his daughter without any evidence to support such claims. During the third trial, Terry Labour, a respected blood expert, countered the prosecution's blood spatter evidence, highlighting inconsistencies and inaccuracies in their claims. Moreover, the defence exposed the fraudulent qualifications of Rod Englert, the supposed blood spatter expert relied upon by the prosecution. His lack of formal training and experience undermined the credibility of the evidence presented against Dave. The case has raised questions about the American justice system's flaws including heavy reliance on questionable evidence, specious claims of motive, and the impact of public opinion on trials. After years of legal battles and appeals, David Cam was finally found not guilty in 2013. After two convictions and 13 years behind bars for the murders of his wife and two children, David Cam walks out of an Indiana courthouse tonight. He is a free man. Good evening. For the first time, David Cam left the Boone County Courthouse a free man, handcuffs gone. He said nothing and showed no reaction to his new status. But just minutes before, inside the courtroom, an emotional Cam broke down sobbing at the jury's not guilty verdict. Uh, it was almost like the emotions I saw that night, only in a different way. The night I was over there when I saw David uh, rolling on the ground and wailing and weeping over his family, uh, he was weeping that way today for joy, is the way I looked at it. Just, just completely overwhelmed. Well, what can you say after being in the 13 years for something that you know you didn't do? Despite the not guilty verdict, public reactions were mixed, with some surprised by the outcome, while others believed that Dave should not be out of prison. The case continues to receive attention from wrongful conviction advocacy groups, which viewed the previous convictions as miscarriages of justice. They filed civil lawsuits against the various parties involved, seeking damages for the ordeal he endured. Settlements were reached in some of these lawsuits, providing some closure to the long and contentious legal battle. David Cam's case is a reminder of the challenges faced by individuals wrongfully accused and convicted and the profound impact it can have on their lives and families. Despite being eventually found not guilty, the damage done by public opinion and media coverage is hard to reverse. The court of public opinion can be harsh and unforgiving, making it difficult for exonerees to fully reintegrate into society. This is why I think that compensation is essential, so they can try and build a new life outside prison. The media, in my opinion, is also to blame. They sensationalize these cases, causing trial by public opinion, rather than hard facts. In my opinion, this entire saga was a mess from the very beginning, and I'm still struggling to understand why the prosecution was so determined to get a guilty verdict against David Cam. The case was clearly flawed from the beginning, and normally a prosecutor would not have authorized the arrest with so little evidence. In addition, Cam had an ironclad alibi. On that alone, I feel he should have been ruled out immediately. Why did the prosecutor get involved in the crime scene? Why did they allow a fake expert to look at the blood spatter? 
Surely it would need to be done at a crime lab. Surely the crime scene investigators were supposed to investigate and collect evidence as required by law. Why did they ignore evidence and not have the two foreign DNA samples tested and searched for any matches? Murderers have had their cases thrown out with much more evidence than this on a mere technicality. Why did the judges allow evidence to be heard that they knew should not have been allowed? The case could have been solved almost immediately with the DNA match that was there in their system all along. Bill Lamb, President and General Manager of WDRB, the Fox affiliate in Louisville, Kentucky, issued a public apology to Cam stating, Seven years ago, I did a point of view criticizing David Cam's attorneys for seeking yet another appeal right after his second conviction for the murder of his family. I wondered when Indiana taxpayers would get to stop paying fortunes and trial expenses, and why any accused killer could possibly deserve so many do-overs. Well, now we have the answer, when they're not guilty. Perhaps the reason for the mess is as simple as a juror's response when asked the question, do you think that they intentionally wanted to convict an innocent man? The juror responded, I would hope not, but I sensed that the state police had a hard time admitting that they had made a mistake. What are your thoughts on this case? What do you think of the prosecution's absolute insistence on his guilt, even though it seemed very clear that he was innocent? Thank you for watching. We appreciate you joining us today. If you enjoyed the video, please like and subscribe. And remember, keep your loved ones close and stay safe until the next one.